Hey, how's it going, everybody? My name is Greg Brown from Foundry, and today we are joined by three very talented users who have put together some exciting demos for you. All three are amazing artists with deep knowledge of Mesh Fusion and are also exceptional educators and communicators. When we started revising Mesh Fusion, we brought them in as expert advisors, and I can't thank you guys enough for your time and your contributions over the past year. Uh, your influence can actually be directly seen across the new workflow, and now we're going to get to see um, how each of you are leveraging it. So uh, first off, uh, I'd like to introduce these three users, uh, Lauren, John, and Ed. If you want to say hi and say something quick about yourselves, that would be great. Start off with you, Lauren. Uh, sure. Hi. Um, I've been a Moto user for a long time, and I've been using Mesh Fusion uh, since it was introduced. I use it a lot in my um, everyday work. I work in the footwear industry. Um, yeah, I'm pretty excited about these new changes, and I think it's really it's 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 going to be popular. Awesome. And John, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yes, uh, my name is John Bavaresco, and uh, I've been a Moto user since version three, uh, <laughs> ancient uh, user, and uh, uh, you know I've uh, I fell in love with it from the first try, and uh, uh, it's been a great tool in my arsenal for a very long time. Uh, I'm an instructor currently at, at the Academy of Art University uh, in San Francisco, uh, doing online instruction with the Industrial Design School. And uh, yeah, Mesh Fusion is definitely, uh, uh, Moto and Mesh Fusion are definitely uh, a part of that uh, course instruction. So yeah. Awesome. And Ed. Yep. So um, my name is Ed Ferrari. Um, I'm a 3D production artist over at New Balance Athletics. Um, I use Moto every day uh, for work. And I've been a Moto user since uh, 601. So, oh, also, um, I've been using Mesh Fusion since the beginning, since it was a plugin, and uh, it's probably my favorite, my favorite part of Moto. And uh, I think Moto 15 uh, specifically is, is we're seeing some of the the biggest improvements and uh, the most significant changes to Mesh Fusion. So it's pretty exciting times for me. Spectacular. Thanks so much, guys. And uh, since we got a lot of content to go over in this interview, uh, we're just going to kick it off and start off with uh, a video from Lauren showing us how she uses Mesh Fusion in her day to day workflows. The curve offset by Mesh is a mesh operation that gets a lot of use. You can use it to create a positive or negative offset of an existing curve or both. The mesh that you input into this mesh up is going to dictate how your curve offsets. So in this case, I'm using the last, but sometimes I like to use a plane or a curved surface to give myself accurate and consistent bite line geometry that adheres to a last. So you can see that I have a consistent offset here that I can adjust. Um, sometimes I need an exact number for my bite line offset. In this example, I'm using a curve to sketch out a bite line that is offset from the last using a plane. The bite line remains consistent, and I have a flexible and easy way of editing this should I need to make any changes. I can use these curves combined with an outsole outline that I've produced in a similar way to sketch out a basic read of my midsole. It remains procedurable, whoa, that is not a word, procedural and flexible. Now with these parts, I can generate a basic midsole envelope. I've taken a few more steps with this shape by procedurally weighting and pushing this center edge with a fall off. You can see that the weight and the push fits within the bounds of the fall off. And of course, everything is still editable, including the original envelope. Now, with all of these editable pieces in place, I now have what I need to produce a midsole buck using Mesh Fusion. So part of the nature of live Booleans versus non-live dead Booleans is that all of your cutter and intersection pieces stick around. Normally, you would cut something with something else, and the shape that you're left with is what you've got. By keeping everything live, you find yourself juggling a lot of pieces that play different roles and have different relationships with those different pieces. That's a complicated balancing act that you have to manage as a designer, 
but Mesh Fusion's new workflow helps you manage that by simplifying the workflow and the UI. So for starters, there's a lot less buttons, but at no cost to functionality. I'm pretty happy about that because I've been using Mesh Fusion since it was introduced. It's a powerful tool, but it's always suffered from a complicated interface and an excess of settings, most of which I ignored because I couldn't figure out what they did. Okay, I'm gonna start my fusion with the envelope shape. Clicking on new fusion creates my fusion item. And when I click away, you can see that my envelope disappears. And you can see that I've also lost my edge weighting. So I'm gonna click on the fusion and then enable edge weighting again. You use this select source mode to add to and select from your fusion. As I partially demonstrated before, after you've used a part to trim something or add or whatever, and you click anywhere in the viewport to deselect it, its visibility is disabled and it is out of your way. But uh, I'll show you how to grab these items back again in a second. I'm just gonna use this outsole outlined to trim the bottom here. So new fusions are color coded to indicate whether a surface was made by a trim, intersection or addition. And if you click on a surface in source mode, it'll select the source that produced that surface. So what this does is it centralizes the process within the 3D viewport, which is where you wanna be spending your time anyway. Instead of rummaging through your items, trying to remember what part cut what from where. I'll show my last step here, which is to subtract the last from the envelope, like so. When I click it in the 3D viewport, the last disappears and you can see that darker color there that denotes a subtraction. If I click on it, if I'm still in source mode, it will select the last. Voila. Okay, I'm turning off uh, select source mode so I can select the fusion to show you that you can still edit the strip widths for your whole fusion the way you're used to. But now let's use edit attribute to select a strip item. When you do, a little head pops up, which gives me the option to override the default fusion settings for this selected strip. And I'll select strip width, then drag left and right in the viewport to edit the strip's width. Again, centralizing the workflow in the 3D viewport. And you can see that it comes with a nice little preview display of what my strip's gonna look like. So it's just a lot more responsive. I'll do the same to the profile as well. So now what I'm left with is a completely editable buck shape made from three simple pieces. This is an asset that I could easily turn into a shareable assembly to use with different starter elements or to share with my colleagues. That is absolutely fantastic. And thank you so much for that, that demo, Lauren. Um, that was, that was great. Um, anybody else want to kick off some questions, John? Well, first of all, uh, I did not have an opportunity to uh, play with some of the new procedural operations in in uh, Moto 15, but uh, you know, having seen that, I am just chomping at the bit now to really jump into some of those. So yeah, um, yeah, I can't Moto's a master of proceduralism for sure. The yeah. the procedural mesh ops combined with Mesh Fusion really. Um, like that's my day in, day out. They're really powerful. I just really like not uh, being able to edit something that I did at the beginning. Cause, um, in my line of work, I changes are just guaranteed. So, um, I got, I got better at those anticipating the kinds of changes that were just going to ruin my whole day. So I, I just start building, assuming I'm going to have those kind of changes and, um, with mesh fusion combined with, with Moto's procedural mesh ops, I'm able to accomplish a lot in terms of being did able to be use, flexible. Did you use an array to fill that, those two curves, the upper and lower curve of the, uh, uh, of the, of the sole? Yeah, to create my, my first envelope piece, yeah, I used um, the new arrays. I think those were introduced in 14, 13. It was interesting. It looked like the envelope, like kind of like, you could see it building over time, like it kind of like wrapped around the midsole. Yeah, yeah. a little bit for show there. It's <laughs> very cool. The resolution of that envelope as well, so. Say that again, John. Uh, I said you can obviously control and maintain uh, control over the resolution of that envelope as well. Uh, yeah, that's right. 
Yeah, you can, um, with the arrays, you just change the stepping amount. And as long as it, the curves match, then you'll, you'll um, yeah, you can change the, the resolution. All right. That is uh, some serious moto swagger, because there is such a thing. <laughs> All right. So uh, another Real thing. Real quick, I, I just your, also, um, I just wanted to mention that uh, the uh, your use of uh, offset curve by mesh was, was pretty eye-opening to me, um, because I hadn't used that. Um, in conjunction with mesh fusion, but that was a great example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use, I use that one a lot, definitely. What um, what curve type was that? Um, was it standard moto curves or? Yeah, just a regular spline curve. Cool. Just regular spline. Wow. Awesome, awesome. And actually, that kind of brings up uh, two other things that were added in fifteen L. Uh, one is the accurate edge weighting for mesh fusion, and so mesh fusion accurately reproduces sub uh, sub D edge weights. Uh, but that also uh, led to an improvement of our standard sub Ds, where now edge weighting is correctly interpolated between mm -hmm. points along an edge, so you'll get much cleaner edge weights if you want to feather that with a fall off. Uh, like yeah, particularly when you're feathering with a fall off, you want you, you need accurate edge weights or else, you know, it's just not going to work for you. Exactly. And that's another yeah. one of those great ones from Taz that I was like, Hey, can you do this? And it was like done in an hour. It was fantastic. Until you pointed that out to me, I didn't even realize that um, edge weighting had been so, so wrong because it really, it's only if you're looking at it up close or if you have a fall off. But um, now that, now that I see it correctly, it's the difference is night and day. It's a huge improvement. Yeah. I mean, I've experienced that, uh, that edge weighting before that, that just didn't work for me. Uh, when I needed it to, but now uh, the improvements are, are, are just phenomenal. So. Excellent. Well, uh, Lauren, so um, what, what is your background? How did you end up becoming a 3D artist? Oh, um, it feels very much like a game of Plinko. Um, I just kind of followed my nose in terms of what I found interesting and engaging. Um, I originally went back to um, art school to study animation, like traditional animation, because I just like to draw. And then um, found my way into industrial design because I, I really liked um, technology and I was always um, kind of computer savvy. So it seemed like it had a nice mix of the two with problem solving um, mixed with 3D elements. Um, and then I popped over into VFX because there, there's just so much cool stuff going on over there. Um, so I did that in the advertising industry for a little while um, and learned a lot of stuff that I use um, every day. And I think a lot of that um, thinking and, and the methodologies found in VFX are really finding a, a home in in industrial design. So now um, I found my way to footwear, um, uh, partially because of the training uh, materials that I was making um, and putting on YouTube. And um, I'm using both of those skill sets from my industrial design background and VFX background um, heavily in my day to day life. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, that kind of perfectly segues into the next question I have for you. Um, you've become very technical in your use of Modo. What led you to that? And have you always been technically inclined? Um, I guess yes and no. I came when I started, started studying industrial design, I learned SolidWorks. And in SolidWorks, you kind of build this tree with all these, these nesting relationships so that things kind of all work together. And I found that really restrictive at the time. Um, which is what attracted me to Moto. And then um, Moto's introduction of, of mesh ops kind of allowed me to have the best of both worlds. Um, and also, I'm, I mean, I, I like puzzles, like I, I'm like a crossword person. So just figuring out how to build up a little rig that has all the little features that I want um, just gets me going. I like doing it. So um, I, I would say I've become more technical um, or my interests have become more technical um, as I've been, been a Moto user, but that just comes with um, the added functionality that's been given to me to use. You're clearly inclined because <laughs> it's great, great work. All right. Um, so there's there's a lot to the new Mesh Fusion workflow. What is your favorite addition and why? Um, I would just say the simplification of it overall has made it a lot more usable. Um, as I mentioned in the video, there's a lot of things that you have to manage as a designer, because you have all of these parts making a final piece and some of them are cutting and some of them are intersectors and um, you've got to juggle those because they, they're just still there when you're done. Um, so having to do that in addition to an interface that um, sometimes is confusing to read made it harder. And I, I tended to lean towards just staying in the schematic to do the work where this, I can really just sort of close a bunch of the panels and just focus on the actual modeling process. Even if I've built those 
building blocks procedurally, when it's time to start cutting things and assembling things, I can just sort of like forget about all of the, the settings and the panels and just build. Um, and it feels very hands-on, which is what one of the things that really attracted me to Moto initially, it felt like I was kind of drawing in 3D and it kind of feels like a return to that. Awesome. That That is, yeah, as you will know, that is definitely the goal here. And uh, people will continue to see that improve over time as well. Um, between the awesome work that you do in Moto and the help that you provided as an alpha tester, do you find any other time for other pursuits? What do you do when you're not being a 3D artist and educator? Um, yeah, actually, because well, COVID's really brought us all indoors for long stretches of time. And um, I think like a lot of people that has exhausted me over the past year. So um, I've picked up painting. I do a lot of painting outside, like traditional with paintbrush, um, which has been really therapeutic and, and it's gotten me away from my screen, which is really important. Um, and other than that, I, I like to play sports. When I cool, can. awesome. And uh, yeah, I definitely look forward to your, uh, your painting updates on Facebook. It's been awesome seeing you kind of like very rapidly grow as, as a traditional painter on a digital canvas, I guess. Yeah, a little bit of both. I got an iPad, so that's, that's I mean, it's still a screen, but it gets to, gets me outside. And then I, I picked up a little watercolor set and just kind of messing around, taking little tutorials on YouTube, same way I learned how to use Moto. Awesome. 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 Yeah. I'm All a right. big fan of your, um, the little alleyway you've been painting. Um, oh it's, yeah. It's your favorite alley. <laughs> it's uh, just like a pretty on... alley near my house. And every time I walk by the light throughout the day, I'm like, oh, it's so beautiful. So I keep <laughs> returning to it. <laughs> to paint it. Yeah. I definitely look forward to your updates, your painting updates. They're, Thanks, guys. they're awesome. Yeah. Very sweet. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for that demo. It was spectacular. And uh, now we're going to move on over to John and take a look at the two, uh, two demos that he put together for us. One of the things I really like about Mesh Fusion is its ability to work with curves as trim items. And uh, it's had that ability for a very long time, but over the last few versions, it's gotten really good, especially when it comes to Bezier curves. Now you can use, uh, curves either procedurally or you can uh, build them in direct modeling tools. You can also add procedurals to curves to control other aspects of the uh, trim itself. So let me show you a couple of ways we can use curves. Uh, in this case, we're using Bezier splines or Bezier curves. And uh, I'm just going to take this front one here and I'm just going to do a straight subtractive trim with it. So I'm going to, uh, let's see, this, this guy right here and uh, hold down the control and and click on the helmet primary and then uh, just sub click on the subtractive trim button there now i don't see anything happening at first in a lot of cases i found you have to make some minor adjustments to uh, make it show up so i'm going to select the uh, front the lower front curve vent there and uh, i'm going to adjust a couple of settings right here one is the extrude along the surface normal and the other one is the uh, ex manual extrusion depth because sometimes default just doesn't uh, work for you so you want to use manual and uh, and you might find that you have to adjust the amount of the depth for our purposes 100 millimeters is working fine so let's try this trim in models of this sort, uh, this process uh, works fine for the most part. However, uh, what we notice here is that you have a pretty much set draft angle and there's not a lot of control you have over it just by using a straight extrude. Now, what I wanna do is actually control the angle of the vent intrusions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this guy here, this lower middle guy, and I'm going to add a procedural operation. So I'm gonna open up the stack here and uh, the operation I'm gonna add is called a curve sweep. All right, so I've added that curve sweep, but the curve sweep also needs a path to know what uh, what to sweep along. So I already have a path built in there. You can barely see it sticking out of the surface there. And in fact, I just might uh, turn off the fusion item for now so we can see this a little bit better. And uh, I'm going to go to path shape right here, add path. You can also add it in the properties panel here. So uh, let me go over to my path lower center right there, double click on that, and there it is. So right off the bat, you can see it's, it's there, but it's uh, kind of at the wrong angle. So I'm going to you go to my uh, curve sweep settings there if I go near the top where it says align right there I'm going to uncheck that okay 
and it's much more closely aligned to the curve that I have set there and I think uh, that's fine for now. We can also make adjustments to the extrusion angle by adjusting the path of which it's extruding along and uh, I can show you that real quick. If I click on this uh, center path here, go to polygon mode, if I click on that, now I can control the draft angle this way. Okay. But another cool way of controlling this draft angle is by uh, tapering it and using the uh, procedural operations here in this sweep curve. You'll notice down here at the bottom you have gradients. We have a twist and a scale gradient right here. And I'm going to adjust the scale gradient of this uh, extrusion. And I'll do that by going to the, uh, to the gradient editor, which I like using better than these. Uh, so with that highlighted, go down near the bottom, you will see the scale gradient. And of course, I need a second uh, keyframe to make this work for me. So I'm going to mouse over just above the, the little measurement numbers there and just uh, click right there. I suppose you can click also in this band as well. So... I have a keyframe there at 100%. That's 100% of this curve. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit so I can uh, see where I'm going to move this. And I'm going to move it in a negative direction. So I'm going to just drop that down. As you can see, as I drop that down, we get a nice taper. All right. Yeah. And uh, maybe I want to click this and control the node handles there, the uh, keyframe handles. And yeah get that sort of a shape. All right, so I'm going to leave with that and uh, let's go to the fusion item. Let's go ahead and apply this as a subtractive trim. So I'm going to go to this vent lower center item there and I'm going to hold down the control key, hit the helmet primary there and uh, click on subtract. Give it a second and there it is. And of course, while this is live, I can still make adjustments to this. Let's go to the lower center, go to polygons and click on that. And let me just bring this over a little bit more. Yeah. So as you can see, using procedurals is a great method of getting control over the various draft angles. Very cool. One of the things I like about the new mesh fusion are the way the various trims are represented by different material types. This allows you to very clearly see the different uh, trim types that you have on your surface at a glance. Now, because this uh, these material shaders are fully exposed to the user. You have complete and total control over the looks of these various trim types. For example, if you look in the shader tree, you'll see fusion item. Within that is sub masks for strips, primaries, additives, subtractives, and intersections. And all those are fully adjustable and editable by the user. Now on the top here, I've added another matte cap shader as simply an override because there are times when I actually want to see my product in just one tone or one uh, shade. And uh, believe me, I've got literally hundreds of matte caps I can use to, to do this with. So if you uh, are familiar with how to use matte caps, this should be a breeze for you. Now I'm going to uncheck that and I'm going to make some adjustments to these various uh, trim shaders. So on my primary, I've added another matte cap over right on top of the existing matte cap and I'm just going to activate that. And there we can see very nice, nicely shaded helmet surface. I can uh, also do the same with the subtractive trims. You can override any of these with any matte cap that you might have. So for example, on this top override here, I might want to choose a different matte cap. Let me just go over to my matte caps. As you can see, I literally have a full library of different types of matte caps that I can use. So uh, let's try this one. Let's see what that looks like. There we go. Yeah and you can get completely crazy with these. So fully editable shaders for the different trim types in Fusion. Very cool. That was wonderful, John. Can't thank you enough for, uh, for both of those videos. Um, it, the, you know, the, uh, the Mac caps, that was, that was your idea. Uh, we were working on the shading and you were like, why don't we well, use Mac caps? And it's like, why don't yeah. we use Mac caps? And one of the uh, uh, lessons that I did for my students uh, to teach them uh, Mesh Fusion, uh, was a uh, was a guitar body, did electric guitar body, and while I was uh, you know developing that that uh, lesson, 
uh, I realized that the madcaps allowed me to see the contours of the shape of, the, of that particular type of a sculptural uh, model much easier than the default uh, viewport was allowing me. So I would, I would actually change out to uh, even zebra stripes to, to check the surfaces and things like that uh, uh, to get them you know, more accurate. Now, uh, for the lesson, we weren't that, that picky about you know, how, how well the contours looked, uh, but I do uh, you know, make sure that the students understand uh, how these uh, how mesh fusion uh, trim items work and, and, uh, and how they can get clean results versus uh, uh, sloppy results. But uh, actually the uh, madcap shaders really allowed me to see in a little more detail uh, the, the surface contours. So that was that was the the impetus for uh, suggesting that suggesting those, but uh, yeah, and the fact that uh, we can adjust those mat caps to actually present almost a real time, uh, you know, uh, presentation render, you know, right in the viewport is really cool, especially hard surface models like you know, like a bicycle helmet or something like that, which uh, mat caps lend themselves very well to. Um, the other thing was that uh, uh, you can also adjust in the advanced viewport, which I don't use enough of actually, but within the advanced viewport, you notice that you can actually uh, change the gamma and see the gamma updates on, uh, uh, on, those, uh, on those matte cap shaders. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot more functionality with the madcaps in the advanced viewport than there is in the standard OpenGL viewport, almost to where, you know, you can do the same things that you can in a render view, you know? So, yeah. I, I did not know that. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's uh, one of the uh, uh, inspirations to using uh, the advanced viewport. Now, if you have an NVIDIA card, I mean, that's just goes without saying that the advanced viewport is a, a tremendous uh, advantage. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, yeah. I encourage people to start using that uh, ADP more often. Cool. Uh, John, I love how um, in your uh, your first demo, the the second curve, uh, rather than using the um, the binormal, you just like created the curve sweep, uh, and yeah. then it had it had the gradient for the taper or flare. I'm definitely going to steal that that technique. Yeah, I was going to say I really like your solution for that. It, it's really like elegant and simple, and I probably would have created something way over-engineered and had really got Well, you know, done. it's not hard to get to where you can create, uh, you know, uh, a, a sort of draft angle that you'd never be able to release from a mold, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, so, uh, yeah. But, uh, you had like the draft and you had like a nice sweep to it as well that you could edit. Yes. I love how, how, and we're going to find this out soon, but all of you seem to center around using mesh fusion with some kind of curve usage, extrusion or yeah. arrays or whatever. Mesh fusion, yeah. when I when I first started using it, um, we could use curves, uh, but it was just very limited. And uh, and a lot of times you felt like you were just kind of walking on eggs and you, you, you get shell shocked after a while, you know, save before you do this next function, you know, because you know it might go away on you. But uh, <laughs> now I'm, I'm just brute force throwing stuff at it, you know, right and left, and it's working, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, wow, okay, <laughs> that's great, you know, so it's, it's pretty solid now, I mean, much more than it ever has been, it's always been a good tool, but, and for me, having come from an industrial design uh, background, in, in, in a sense, I, 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 you know, went to Art Center and back in the 80s before we had actual, when we were doing markers and chalk renderings, right, um, and, uh, you know, I dropped out because I simply couldn't afford it anymore. Uh, but I went into visual effects for that. But I still have this love for design and love for industrial design. And Moto just speaks to me, you know, in that respect as, as a designer. And I think it does with most uh, people that have a bent for industrial design. Um, but I think more so um, it's, it gives a designer a look that would normally be very difficult to achieve outside of a CAD application. 
And I think that's the thing that I really like about mesh fusion is, is I mean, it is close, you know, you're using sub D surfaces to pre present something that looks like it was produced in alias or something like that. So yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and, and again, you know, Moto is for really ideation and conceptualization, you know, uh, you, you're obviously going to have to take your model at some point into a CAD application for manufacturing, but to get to that point to where you can really visualize uh, uh, your ideas as accurately as seeing them, you know, <laughs> uh, in reality, uh, when you get to some of these nice presentation renderings, it's like I've seen I've seen some of these really talented moto artists out there produce products that look like they they were photographed you know and uh, to be able to get to that point with one package moto uh is phenomenal as far as i'm concerned you know and uh, as somebody who loves design i like to take everything from just rough napkin sketch to a really polished product rendering um and i can do that with moto you know Phenomenal, and I, and I I really like the the a, the Mac app suggestion from you because I mean it also led to uh, um, you basically get the same results in the advanced viewport versus the default viewport because they both support Mac caps. Uh, you get better yeah. topology shading in the advanced viewport from uh, from fourteen two, right? But uh, but for the most part, they're very very close uh, in in, in yeah. their representation. Yeah, but you can also get shadows too, and uh, you know ambient inclusion in advanced viewport. So. Definitely yeah, we, you know, in depth of field with with the uh, 15 update, yeah. we, we do have plans. Yeah, we do have some, some more plans for advanced viewport, huh? I said, I, I saw that. I had, I've been so deep into mesh fusion, I, I missed that update, but I just saw that before this and looks good. It is, it is. And it actually was, I, I saw a comment from somebody like, why do we need this? And I'm like, I, I guess maybe you don't render very often, but being able to just quickly see the effect of shifting your, your depth of field um, and then applying that to a render without having to wait at all is, is extremely valuable, regardless of how fast your render is, because this will update it for you instantly. So, mm -hmm. John, you were educated as a designer, like you brought up. And when I first met you, you actually you worked in visual effects, but now you seem to do and teach both. How are they similar? And uh, what is your highest priority when teaching both of these? Well, my highest priority in teaching, I'll take the last question first, um, <laughs> is to uh, get across the concepts uh, uh, that, that uh, Moto presents or that 3D modeling presents essentially. And uh, sometimes it's hard for people to wrap their head around certain concepts. You know, I remember when I was learning Photoshop way back when, and I didn't understand what an alpha channel was. Did not, couldn't figure out what's an alpha channel, you know? And when uh, somebody presented to me, is, uh, like it is a color zero channel. Think of it like, like transparency, like a window. It's like, aha, now once I got it, I understood that. And now it, it really opened up all different kinds of possibilities to me, you know, as an artist. And uh, same with Moto, if you can present uh, the ideas as conceptually to them, so they can understand it uh, on a conceptual level, then they will understand how those tools can can be used in what they want to do. And so that's that's the important thing to me. And so it's not just going through the tutorial and you know building the the shoe the way I've presented it to them. It's showing them how these tools function so that they can take their ideas and utilize the tool. You know, and one of the things I really uh, stress is uh, to my students is to use Moto every day, even if it's for five minutes. You're sitting with your laptop in front of the TV. Do something with it. You know, just you know, you're training uh, your your um, your motor reflexes to you know to navigate or to move around and things like that. So it's very simple kinds of things, and don't worry about getting these these exotic ideas out right away. Start with small steps. You know. And, uh, and work your way up, you know, divide and conquer is what I say. Sometimes when they're having problems uh, and we have to do a Skype meeting, I break it down for them. And I give them those tools to, to just kind of reduce it to, you know, maybe create a simpler scene and let's just figure out what's going on with that, you know. 
Uh, John, did That's they ever subdivide and conquer? I'm sorry. Subdivide and conquer. <laughs> I'll, see, I'll see myself out. Uh, okay. he's no, you're, you're, you're no, exactly that's what i was gonna go for <laughs> exactly i can't and, even help uh, myself yeah. at this point uh -huh. <laughs> right yeah the, we need a we need a weekly dad joke from ed now <laughs> all right uh but uh you know it's interesting that you, you you mentioned uh do something that was one of the one of the things you said in there uh, it, it almost seems like no matter what it is that you you're interested in whether maybe it's fitness like when i when i tried to start exercising again every day i told myself do something maybe it's just do a single set of push-ups but do right. something and i said the same thing to myself when i learned 3d you know because it is it's that you get if you work a regular job and you get to the end of your day you come home and you're like i i don't want to do this right now just tell yourself to do something and do five minutes it won't be you know, five minutes it'll be a couple hours not, but <laughs> yeah it's not like riding a bicycle you do forget and uh mm -hmm. i will say that if if i were to have to get back into uh light wave and maya i wouldn't know my way around i really wouldn't you know it's how oh, you it's, i'm sure you would find it but but yeah exactly it's that it. muscle memory yeah and just that effort of, of you know the discipline of doing something toward a goal every single day you know right, is right. incredibly valuable so how long have you been using moto and why do you choose to continue using it well i was the digital domain uh, working on some commercials at the time and um Brad Hayes, who was a, was a producer there, had a, a beta copy of Moto. And uh, I was there, I think we were working on a Chrysler commercial or something like that. But I said, hmm, uh, I, you know, because I'd seen it before and I thought it looked really interesting. I asked him if I could use it. So he, he uh, uh, put a copy on my machine and uh, said, uh, I came in the next day and there it was. And so he just gave me a few little tutorials and little, little, hints and how to do this but i tell you within 15 20 minutes i was moving my way around i was building stuff it was just like wow this is this is what i wanted my 3d application to be you know and although it didn't have uh, animation tools in it at the time it was strictly a modeler uh it was phenomenal i thought it was i was just able to uh it was very intuitive to me i think so um that's how I got introduced to it. And that was like version three. And, uh, uh, and I've been with it ever since, you know, I said, here, take my money, please. You know, <laughs> and, uh, and as I guess it uh, is probably my design background that, that it, it uh, resonated with and uh, something like that. But yeah, it was, uh, it was a great tool. But uh, but what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you, you answered it. It was how long you've been using Moto and why do you choose to continue yeah. using it? Yeah. So you answered it. That's that's perfect. You know, I, I worked in industrial, uh, excuse me, in visual effects for such a long time. And uh, they, we all know that, the, you know, the 800 pound gorilla in the room is, is Maya and, and, uh, and uh, also Lightwave as well. But um, I always tried to shoehorn Moto into every project that I worked with is visual effects, even if I had to bring it with me, you know, on my own, uh, on, a, on a thumb drive or something like that. And uh, just, you know, build, you know, if I were tasked with, uh, uh, you know, uh, building, uh, I don't know, a, a, an architectural structure or something like that, up comes Moto, you know, and I build it. And then I'd worry about getting those assets into the other applications later for rendering. But mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I remember cool. yeah, I actually. On, uh, actually worked on a uh, show for Discovery Channel, which was about dinosaurs. And I uh, had to model a ple ple plesiosaurus, and, uh, which is that little underwater, a big underwater fish thing, you know, like Loch Ness. And uh, so uh, I, I, we were using Lightwave at the time, and I, and I had modeled parts of it in Lightwave, and then I thought, oh, I'm just going to bring it over into Moto and model it. And I finished the model in Moto. And uh, the producers loved it. It was great. And uh, then then they needed it animated. And I thought, uh, uh, there's no way I was going to animate in that version of Moto at the time. It was pre-animation. But Moto could uh, handle, um, oh, shoot, what is it? Uh, where you bake in oh, the, the, the okay yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. or alembic mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I, I think on DVDs. So I did the rig and uh, animation in in Lightwave. Rigged it, animated it, made it swim. It's it's you know going on and on. Then I saved out the MDD, brought it into Moto, and because I really liked Moto's rendering, uh, it mm -hmm. was it was really superior to anything else out there, really as far as I was concerned. And and your eye really picked up on that, mm -hmm. and uh, and I rendered the the animation in in Moto. Awesome. Awesome. And last question. Um, how has the experience been for you working with the new mesh fusion workflow? Oh, uh, well, I think, uh, the helmet, uh, speaks volumes. Uh, it's was much easier for me to, uh, dial in, uh, the chamfers and radiuses that I wanted to get. And, uh, and I think for my students, it's going to be much better too. Uh, because, uh, from past experience, when uh, they first open up the Mesh Fusion toolbox, it's quite a bit to look at. And the fact that, <laughs> you know, you wind up scrolling just to get to the bottom of it uh, was, uh, is something that uh, students really don't like to do. They don't really like to be overwhelmed uh, with something at the very beginning. Um, so I think the, the new workflow is, is a godsend really, you know, and it's a top to bottom workflow, you know, it's, it's very logical. And, uh, and yeah, it just, it just works for me. Awesome. And, and awesome. And more I to come. Yeah. That even though it looks reduced, all the tools, all the functionality is there. It's just tucked away where you, you don't need to access it right away. You don't have to look at it. You know? Yeah. Slowly exposed. And one of the things that was great about having you guys as a team to, to help with, you know, designing this new mesh fusion workflow is that we're not just getting your input, you all three of you are educators. And so was constantly getting input from all three of you about what other people's people who your trainings experience were uh, was and that was that was incredibly valuable. Yeah. Well, awesome. you, know, I, you know, I've been around to not just training uh, students at Academy, but I've trained seasoned designers as well from Honda and Tesla and uh, Mercedes Benz. I've trained their design teams. I've trained, uh, you know, Bell Helmets, uh, Specialized Bikes, to name a few, and uh, they all uh, they all have uh, very similar sort of uh, uh, reactions to to Moto. It's like, you know, this is great. Where has this been all my life? You know, awesome, so. awesome, awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, Ed, uh, we now are going to play your video and take a look at the. The, the, the complexity that you are known for. <laughs> this fabulous, fabulous okay, scene that you cool. put together. Hey, this is Ed Ferrari. I'm a 3D production artist at New Balance Athletics. And in addition to using Moto every day at work, I'm also a Moto enthusiast and I use Moto to create art in my spare time. While Moto 15 has a number of key improvements that are making my work life easier, there's one feature in particular that I feel is a massive game changer when it comes to creating complex designs. This feature has to do with Mesh Fusion source items and the strips created by those source items. Uh, this feature is seemingly inconspicuous, but it opens the doors for some things that were not possible in previous versions of Moto. The name of this new feature is Strip Per Intersection. So I'm going to demonstrate how it works and I'll explain the benefits of its inclusion in Moto 15. Uh, but before I move on to something uh, as complex as what I'm showing on screen right now, um, I'm going to start with a very basic example, just so we understand the premise. Here I have a Bezier curve. Uh, it's the Foundry F dot logo, and uh, it consists of some sharp angles and uh, the, the dot, which is just a circle with no sharp angles. Um, so I'm just going to work to the point where I can show off uh, kind of the new feature in Moto 15, the uh, strip per intersection. So everything I'm about to do is uh, basically available in Moto 14.2. Uh, I'm going to select this uh, cylinder, uh, create a new fusion item, and then I'm going to select my uh, item with the Bezier curve and I'll shift select the primary. But before I do that I have to select the fusion item and make sure I have uh, select source mode enabled. So I'll select the primary and then I'll uh, shift or control click on the Bezier item and I'll just apply primary. And what that does is it creates this kind of wall effect. So we're getting this embossing effect. Uh, now we have a little open area here and there's no cap, but we can definitely solve that. Let me just enable wireframe. Uh, so I'm going to use this uh, cap geometry, uh, which is just this kind of uh, slightly rounded cylinder. 
to, to create the, the cap. Uh, but before I do that, I need the, uh, these walls here to uh, intersect with this cap geometry. So I'll come over to the uh, Bezier curve item and I'll enable manual extrusion depth and then I'll bump the extrusion depth up to 400 millimeters uh, from the default 100. Um, we're not getting anything poking through, but even if we were, the cap geometry would uh, handle that. So with the uh, cap geometry selected, I'll shift select uh, the wall here. Uh, and that will select the item with the Bezier. And the reason I was able to select the geometry in the viewport is because we have select source mode enabled. So that's new to Moto 15. Um, so with both of these selected, I'll just choose apply uh, intersect trim. And it looks like it worked on the dot. Um, so now we're getting that nice cap created by the uh, intersecting geometry, uh, but it's not intersecting uh, the F. Uh, now I happen to know that if we were to um, select the uh, the curve here, I move it around a little bit, it would, it would work. But something else that will work is just enabling sharp Bezier corners. And what that will do is it will actually create a strip anywhere there's a sharp corner on our Bezier curve. Because um, currently it's not creating a strip uh, perpendicular to the curve or uh, vertically. So before I do that, I'm going to change the Bezier corner angle from 45 degrees, which is the default, to 11.25, which is a quarter of uh, 45 degrees. Um, and what that does is it just uh, makes a, a sharp corner at, uh, you know, a less, a lesser threshold. Um, so now here we have all of our strips. Uh, now here is that feature that is new to 15, uh, that I think is a huge deal. It's the strip per intersection feature. Uh, it's new in 15 and it's, it's left off by default, uh, which is in my opinion, um, the way I plan on working all the time. I, I want to leave it off. Um, so let's have a look at what would happen if we were to turn it on. And we're going to not just turn it on on the, um, the Bezier curve, but on all of the fusion source items. So we'll enable that. Um, so with this enabled, Mesh Fusion is behaving the way it did in all previous versions of, uh, of Moto. So if I actually um, toggle this arrow so we can see the child items of the fusion item and then shift uh, click on the arrow next to the strips, you can see all of the strips that are generated. Now, this uh, Bezier curve is pretty simple. Um, it's not very complicated. And if you look at all of the strips that are generated by it, it's, it's pretty, uh, you know, it's, it's already a lot. So you can imagine if we were working with a more complex um, Bezier curve, we would have a, a lot more strip items. I've worked on scenes where you can have like almost 10,000 or a little bit over 10,000 strips and that causes performance issues. It's just too much geometry um, for any software package to handle. Um, so here is the actual strips and we're going to look at what this new feature uh, actually does. So I'll deselect the strips, I'll turn off isolation mode and then on these fusion source items I'm going to disable strip per intersection which is how Moto 15 uh, behaves by default. And now let, let's again look at the uh, strips. So now we only have three items here. So you get a strip item for each uh, corresponding uh, fusion source item, which is, it's really great. Uh, it still gives us the, the ability to uh, change the strip width on a granular level, but not a super granular level. So I can still change uh, just the strips that are associated with uh, the cap, or I can just change the strips that are associated with the sharp corners. Um, and you still have the ability to change uh, just individual strips, but you have to have the uh, strip per intersection uh, enabled for that. Uh, but I think this is, uh, this is huge when you want to work on uh, more complex shapes. So I can still override the defaults and then I can change the strip width to something like 12 millimeters. Uh, and then we get this sort of uh, effect. We get nice kind of procedural bevels, which for all intents and purposes, that's exactly what a strip is. It's just a procedural um, bevel that occurs at um, intersecting areas of geometry. So now that we understand the premise of the strip per intersect uh, feature, uh, let's have a look at how we can use it on something uh, more complex. Uh, so here I have this uh, trinket uh, model that I used as kind of like a test bed uh, to try out all of the new uh, Bezier booleans and curve features. And I want to have a look at um, the the curve that was responsible for creating uh, this, um, these covers, this front and back cover. Uh, now the front cover is live and the back cover is just an instance. Uh, 
because I wanted them to be identical. But if we have a look at this um, this Bezier curve, I mean, it's it's quite intricate. It's it's pretty complex, and we're getting. Um, strips not only where the Bezier corner interacts with the underlying geometry, but also perpendicular to these corner areas. Um, and that's what's huge. So without the strip per intersect feature, uh, we would be looking at thousands upon thousands of strips here. Um, so having that off by default and just having that um, available is, it's a game changer. It just allows us to uh, create these really ornate, intricate, and complex patterns. Um, so if I just have a look at uh, the uh, the front cover here, uh, you can see the type of geometry uh, that we're getting. Uh, and it, it even interacts well with uh, standard uh, mesh fusion geometry. I have some hinges here uh, for that uh, for that front piece. Um, so let's actually work on a slightly less complex uh, part of this. Uh, let's create a little back piece uh, for this. And by the way, all of the uh, little cutouts and all of the gears, and on the other side I have some hands, which we'll have a look at, uh, they're all created with um, uh, curves, and they're, they're all mesh fusion. Uh, so here I have uh, this alternate back area, and let me just make this uh, cap invisible for the moment, and we'll have a look at these curves. So again, these curves are not as uh, quite as complex as the curves used on the cover, um, but they're still, you know, this might have uh, been a little bit more difficult in previous versions of Moto, uh, and now it's, it's really uh, a breeze. So again, I'm just going to select this um, cylinder, and I'll create a new fusion item. And now that I have the new fusion item, I already have select source mode enabled. Uh, I'm going to take my radial pattern, which again is a, it's just a Bezier curve, so if I isolate it, we can just see the Bezier curve with all of the um, sharp points and the, the round areas. And we're going to, whoops, let me just make sure I have the right parts isolated. And I'll make sure I have select source mode enabled. And I'll, with the radial pattern selected, I'll shift select the, uh, the primary and I'll just choose apply primary. Okay, so that's giving us uh, some extrusion, but you can see uh, I always look at these as kind of like buildings, and I know that if I have some tall and some that are short, uh, it just means that I don't have manual extrusion depth enabled on the uh, on the Bezier curve uh, item. And I can even see that we have some poking through, which is fine because we, we have cap geometry that's going to um, prevent that from poking through. So first I'll enable manual extrusion depth so that everything is uniform, and then uh, I'll also increase the extrusion depth to something like 300 millimeters. So that made everything a little bit taller and it also caused it to poke through the bottom. Uh, now I'm going to introduce that, uh, that cap geometry. So with the cap geometry selected, I can then shift select on this wall, which will select the corresponding Bezier curve item in the items list. And then I'll just choose apply trim intersect. So that's looking pretty good. Uh, it's giving me the exact results that I want. Um, it's giving us a cap, and the cap geometry has a slight uh, roundness to it, so that's good. Uh, the one missing piece, in my opinion, is the strips uh, perpendicular to the um, to the Bezier curve, um, and that will having that will kind of solve this this area here where these strips are kind of a little bit weird. Um, so let me enable that right now. I'll enable or I'll select the uh, Bezier curve pattern, and then. Oops, I accidentally uh, made everything, brought everything out of isolation mode. So let me just undo that. Okay, so now I have the radial pattern uh, selected. And I'm going to, before uh, enabling sharp Bezier corners, I'm just going to reduce the Bezier corner angle uh, to 11.25. It's just my preferred angle. And then I'll enable sharp Bezier corners. Okay, so now we have some nice strips uh, wherever we have a sharp angle. So that's looking really, really nice. Um, now what I could do is come over to the fusion item and I can change the uh, strip width for all of the uh, all of the strips. So I'll change that to something like, let's do six millimeters. Okay, so I think that's looking uh, pretty good. So let me go out of isolation mode and we'll have a look at this with the rest of the uh, design. So again, not as complex as the front piece, but you can see that uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty quick to get, that, uh, to get that applied to our back cover of uh, whatever this little trinket uh, is. Uh, now, 
you can imagine the applications for this. Uh, this this whole model is just like a test bed for uh, testing out the new mesh fusion features. Um, but this could easily be applied to you know tread on a tire or tread on you know uh, footwear. Um, it could be used for logos. Uh, it's really um, it's really flexible and it has a wide range of applications. Now let's have a quick look at how easy it is to resolve some common issues. Uh, I'm going to focus on this lower disk area. Um, so I have these uh, symbols here, uh, which I want to treat as emboss elements. Um, so we'll have to create a new fusion item. And now that we have that new fusion item, uh, we'll select the fusion item and make sure we have select source mode enabled. And I'll select the Bezier curves and then shift click on the primary surface. And I'll choose add primary. And as we can see, there are some issues. Um, so some of these have worked perfectly. Uh, I always check my, um, my results of the Bezier um, booleans up close uh, because I know that, let me turn off wireframe. If it looks like little buildings, then it's a success. And uh, if there are uh, holes in the primary and if the buildings appear to be um, inverted or flipped, uh, what I refer to as ghost buildings, um, it just means that the, uh, the Bezier symbols need to be flipped. So this one is flipped correctly, uh, but this one needs to be flipped in polygons mode. So I'll press F to flip and that solved that issue. And let's select the curves that are flipped on this one. It appears to be just a single curve. So I'll press F to flip and that fixes that one. And then it looks like this one is inverted and this one is inverted. So F to flip and that is all fixed. So now let's make these, uh, these buildings, uh, these symbols a little bit uh, taller. So I'll just en enable manual extrusion depth and now if I toggle the visibility of the cap, uh, we can see that now uh, this cap geometry, which is going to uh, limit the height of these uh, symbol extrusions, um, the cap is much shorter than the, um, than the symbols, which is what we want. So with that selected, I have select source enabled. I'll shift select the, uh, the wall, which selects the corresponding item in the item list. And then I'll just choose apply intersect trim. Now we have uh, a warning here that says the fusion item cannot be commuted, uh, computed with the current values. I'll click OK. And this just uh, can be fixed by simply enabling sharp Bezier corners. Uh, but first I'm just going to decrease the Bezier corner angle to 11.25 and I'll enable sharp Bezier corners. So that worked out great. And if I uh, zoom in, I can see that we have um, strips everywhere there's a sharp corner, which is exactly what we want. So this turned out uh, perfectly. Now if I go out of isolation mode, we can see how this all interacts together. Let me just toggle off the cover. And there's a, a slight problem here. Uh, I have uh, this uh, geometry here, which is uh, created from this curve. Uh, this curve is responsible for uh, this hand, which is supposed to um, kind of revolve around the center point of whatever this is. It's like a some sort of timepiece. Uh, but the hand is actually, um, it's going to kind of, uh, uh, it, it, it will bump into this piece right here. So there's a few ways we can, we can fix this. Uh, let me just take, um, all of this uh, and I'll isolate these pieces as well as these pieces just so we can look at them uh, together. And let me just toggle off locators. Um, so I basically want to uh, make this shorter or this shorter uh, just so uh, this arm will clear the symbol. Um, so it's pretty easy and we have two options. I can either lower this cap uh, which is probably what I'll do. I'll just uh, select this and press W to move and I'll just move it inward a little bit. So we moved that a little bit. Uh, it wasn't enough, but that just gives us an idea of how easy it is to move that. Uh, I can also select in items mode, I can select uh, the bottom of this piece here. And if I want to, I can just move this uh, either in items mode or polygons mode, I can just move this over 
a little bit. So maybe we'll do 15 millimeters to begin with. And we'll see if that was enough. And it probably will just clear it, but let's actually make it a little bit um, thinner. So I'll select this item and then in polygons mode, I'll just move it a little bit more. Maybe we'll just do uh, 10 millimeters. And now let's have a look to see if it's uh, going to clear it. And now I think we're, we're really safe. So making slight adjustments like that is uh, pretty straightforward. It's, it's pretty easy. And uh, that's basically the technique that I used on all of the shapes uh, in this piece. Uh, so it's just uh, knowing how to, how to use Mesh Fusion and then uh, rinse, wash, repeat. So I hope I've been able to demonstrate why I'm so excited about this new Mesh Fusion feature, uh, the strip per intersect. And I truly cannot wait to see how other artists uh, use these tools. Wow. Ed. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank yeah, you, guys. Thanks. it's not painfully you know, obvious from those videos. Um, Ed is, has definitely been the, the MVP of Mesh Fusion testing uh, for this last know. version in terms of like stress testing and testing in general. And just like he's obviously a bit of an insane person to, <laughs> to approach something <laughs> like that. Um, I don't think he hammers on it the way you do, Ed. Yeah, like yeah. that's like a. People should feel some confidence in this update, given how thoroughly Ed has gone through this. Like he used to show up to meetings with something looking kind of like that, although that's definitely more intense, um, and point out all of these little inconsistencies. He'd be like, I'm going to turn this around, and if we get underneath here, and then check to the side, and then if you look at this angle, you can see that that wall's not right, so we're going to need to fix that. <laughs> and, yeah. and we're like, oh, all right, cool, great. Would have never have seen that. So that's really, I think, gone a long way in really refining um, how, how, or this iteration of Mesh Fusion, at least. You know, really, yes, Ed, you just did an amazing job with this. Uh, it, and I, the one thing I'm going to caveat there is you guys are all MVPs of the testing on this. This was, how, you guys have all no. been a humongous help. I'm sorry, go ahead, John. I, you know, I look at that, uh, what, what Ed's done, and, and it's what I say about mesh fusion and, and it's it it's a game changer in a real sense for moto i mean it, it brings it to a new level of of uh usability how else would you have modeled that there's no way you could model that in sub surfaces there is no way uh, i can see you, you can <laughs> produce it and the fact here's the other thing that mesh fusion is quick when you start doing stuff in it you know um uh I, I actually uh, started modeling the interior headband of the of the helmet, and I just thought I'm just going to do it in traditional subdivision surfaces. But there are all these little holes and stuff in that headband, you know, to keep it more optimal, you know, as far as weight goes. And I started modeling those in subdivision surfaces, and I go, you know what? Screw it! I'm just going to go mesh fusion with this thing. Five minutes later, I had that whole band with all the little holes and and intrusions in it modeled perfectly, you know? So, and I think that's, you know, and with, with Ed's example there, which has taken that to an extreme uh, and it's, it's just phenomenal. And uh, again, you know, you just set it up, push the button and let it happen, you know? Yeah, a Love lot the ghost of, buildings. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> But a lot of the complexity is just down to the, the Bezier curves. It's really, um, you, whatever you make as a Bezier curve, um, Mesh Fusion just extrudes it. And um, it looks more complicated than it is. Um, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was, it was actually I, fair, I, fairly easy. Yeah, yeah, you spend a good 90% uh, of your time in the modeling process will be spent building the trim objects. You know, the whole Fusion thing just kind of takes care of itself. Yeah, but building off of what John said earlier, um, it feels like in the in the last few releases, Mesh Fusion has just become more and more um, just uh, stable and and robust. And I'm it's it's causing uh, it's causing me to be a little bit more bold with what I try with it. Um, I'm not kind of holding my breath so much anymore. Um, 
I kind of, maybe I'm taking it for granted, but I kind of just expect it to work now when, when I, you know, when I do something. Um, yeah. Positive side effect of, of revising the workflow was tearing a whole bunch of things out and then having to <laughs> fix all the things we broke by tearing other things out. And so, yeah, I think it did lead to a much more robust mesh fusion, but this is the beginning of actually revisions that will lead to more robustness. Mm -hmm. Um, something you'll probably touch on later, um, Greg, is uh, all of the work with curves. Um, Ed's really turned me on to, to using curves. And um, I don't know if people picked up on it in the video, but using um, curve extrusions that, are, that later get capped by something else. Um, that's something that Ed really hammered on at first. And I always just kind of thought he had a weird way of working with Mesh Fusion, and that was just his thing. Um, and he kept really pushing on like this idea of strips on everything. And then it finally kind of clicked for me. And um, you can see it in the video that I that I made where I use a strip um, to trim the bottom, but that that trim was also creating the cap geometry for the top and the bottom of the midsole shape that I created. And that's a really powerful, simple thing that you might not, I, I mean, I certainly didn't pick up on it right away, but it allows you to create a lot more complexity and density and it allows you to stay working in curves which can be really easy to control as opposed to building intense um, whole airtight cutting pieces of geometry you can just really sculpt things with curves which is a really intuitive um, and flexible way of working nailed it completely nailed it and yes there will be more comments on on that uh, a little bit later and many more Sorry. comments on that in the yeah the, <laughs> no not no that's a good segue um many more comments on that in the uh months to come years to come uh it but really it, did identify something very special and unique there it is just interesting how we all gravitated towards curves um just kind of naturally and it seems like uh it, like uh some of us were using uh the standard Moto curves, the spline curves, some of us are using Bezier curves, um, and Mesh Fusion just chews through it. And, you know, certain curves have their strengths with, with Mesh Fusion. Like, in order to get the sharp Bezier corners, you need to use the, you know, Bezier curve. Um, but it's just, um, it's just a testament to, like, how far Mesh Fusion has come, just how you could take something that wasn't, um, you know, in, in the early days, you couldn't use curves with Mesh Fusion. And now it's just uh, that implementation, like the ability to just take curves, and now you can do... Uh, kind of like what, what Thomas was alluding to, um, you can have like profile fusion where you have like um, a top profile and a side profile or a front profile and where they all kind of intersect with each other, um, that intersection area is kind of like your form. Mm -hmm. Yep, no, then it's, it's, it's an intuitive way for people to work and it's something I, I wanna see uh, happen more often. And one of the things that you really, you changed my perspective on and uh, you know, I, I started here just before uh, mesh, the first Mesh Fusion came out and we were all like sub booleans this is amazing. And that's what we focused on. But then you kind of re-articulated that saying like, you know, that what's actually special are the strips. And you know, that was a complete shift in thinking for me, that observation. From you, it's a fantastic observation. That I yeah, great strips thing. are essentially. I mean, the way I look at it is, um, I, I think I mentioned it in the video. They're just um, procedural bevels, and uh, they 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 occur where you have some geometry uh, intersecting or interacting with each other, um, the, and they're they're pretty that they're pretty robust. Once you have your 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 main setup, um, I mean, you could change the profile of them to some degree. Where you can make them like a like a flat chamfer or more of a rounded uh, bevel. It's um, they're super flexible and they're, yeah, I just the, always look at them as, as just, just bevels. There you go. And the, the, I think the only problem that we have now really is, uh, is implementing all the ideas that you guys have had, uh, because, you know, in the past year, uh, a lot of these conversations like this about strips and stuff have led to other ideas. And so we've got our, uh, we've got our plan pretty well laid out for us uh, as far as the future of mesh fusion and how that'll affect other things. So really quickly, Ed, how, how did you become involved in 3d and what attracted you to Moto? Sure. So I had, um, well, it was kind of, it's been a long road. I, um, I had uh, kind of a traditional background. I loved drawing, painting, sculpting as a kid. And then when it came, uh, came time to go to college, I chose computer animation. And uh, the software that we learned on wasn't, it wasn't Moto. Uh, and I just found it to be a little bit too technical and I wasn't really feeling like, uh, like an artist. And I kind of, I, I basically buckled down and just toughed my way through. Um, I, I graduated, but I, I told myself like, 
I can't, I can't see myself doing this as a career. It's just too, um, it's too removed from, from being an artist. Um, so I, I moved to California and I got involved in film and television. Um, and I was just working like odd jobs. I was doing everything from like being a photo double and a stand in to working as a background actor and doing production assistant work, like just random stuff. Um, but I, 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 I still kind of liked 3d. Um, I think it was, it might've been ZBrush kind of brought me back into it. And then I noticed some really good renders being done. And I was like, where, where are these renders coming from? And that's the first time I heard of Moto. So it was actually rendering, which, um, which kind of led me to Moto. And while I was in Los Angeles, uh, there was a SIGGRAPH in, um, in Anaheim. Uh, so it, which is Orange County right next to Los Angeles County. And I, I went there and I went to the, um, at the time the Luxology booth and they were having like a, a sale on Moto. And I just took it, I just kind of rolled the dice and took advantage of it. And when I modeled in Moto for the first time, I mean, just being able to cut, copy, paste polygons, like that was unheard of from, from the package that I, that I had come from, come from in, in, in college. And, uh, you know, I just, um, that was Moto 601. And I was just, uh, I was floored with how, how much I enjoyed the, the modeling. Um, it was incredible. And then I think 701 is when Mesh Fusion um, was introduced as a plugin. Mm -hmm. And, and that's when, uh, I got really into the P Fusion toolkit, which is kind of almost very similar to what we have now, but it was using B spline um, curves. And um, I started making some some like I was uploading videos to like Vimeo and, and YouTube, and then I got involved with Pixel Fondue. Um, yeah, and that's what kind of led me, you know, to Foundry. I was a Moto evangelist for a while, uh, and that eventually led me to to New Balance, where I'm a 3D production artist. Um, so it was kind of like a winding road, but. Ultimately, it was Moto that pulled me back into it. Uh, Moto just made me the, uh, and uh, the funny thing is what, what I initially was turned off by in other software, which is the technical aspect, that's kind of where I've, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not as, not as technical as, as Thomas. I don't do like uh, as complex uh, things. I, I want to, but I just, I'm not quite there yet. But that's kind of what I've gravitated towards uh, in Moto is working in the schematic, um, using more procedural and less direct destructive modeling. Very cool. All right. So your vision for Mesh Fusion is unique and you have significantly helped drive our priorities. Can you explain what you think is the most unique about Mesh Fusion in general? Yeah, definitely. It, it, it's, um, it's for sure the strips. Um, the, the, the strip interaction is, is key. I mean, uh, I think Mesh Fusion was initially kind of thought of as just a sub D boolean uh, kind of um, like a like a way to just sub D uh, or Boolean sub D uh, models, and uh, while that's true, uh, no other software really gives you the the strips, and that's that's the difference. That's a huge difference. Um, the fact that you get procedural bevels at wherever you wherever you want, you just add more geometry, add a new mesh item. Um, yeah, so that's huge. And now in in fifteen with the strip per intersect, like in fourteen point two. Um, where we had the Bezier booleans, that was that was great. Um, but when you turned on sharp Bezier corners, you really kind of had to hold your breath a little bit because if you had a complex Bezier curve with a lot of sharp corners, it would create so many items. Um, and that's when, when I say it would create a lot of items. Like let's say you have ten thousand items. Well, that's not ten thousand polygons. That's ten thousand strips with you know anywhere from like fifty to a hundred you know faces or or you know, um, 200 triangles. So it's not just like 10,000 polygons, it's 10,000 items. It's, it's a lot for any, any software to, to chew through. Um, so the strip per intersect where you just get um, a single strip item, like for, for each contiguous, you know, strip in a, in a mesh item, that's, that's the biggest thing to happen to Mesh Fusion in, in a long time. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, to share a story, maybe we shouldn't even share, but Ed came into a meeting one day and he's like, I'm working on this, this thing. And I, I, I really, I really like, you know, the, the Bezier Boolean stuff, but um, yeah, it took me uh, 17 hours to load this file. <laughs> like, it was just like, all right, let's yeah. see if we can take care of that. And so that's where the strip printer yeah. section thing came from. And I thought it was pretty cool. And that fixed it. I mean, now it's like, it's, it's really snappy to navigate, to open the scene. I mean, it's, it's the difference is night and day. 
Yeah. yeah and hopefully we can improve that process and ways to manage the uh, global versus local scenario. And that's actually another analog um, to the rest of Moto. It's like the way that the shader tree works is local mm -hmm. versus global ordering. And it's something that I want to see uh, uh, kind of um, accentuated more in mesh fusion, uh, being able to start at a very wide level with big edits and then move into more granular um, in a comfortable way. So um, your training is excellent and you offer surprising insights for how Mesh Fusion can be leveraged. We've seen your amazing videos on Pixel Fondue. Do you have any more plans for this kind of content uh, in the future? Yeah, so um, at the moment I have a seven month old daughter which she's just dominating my life. But as soon as uh, time kind of, if, if I have free time I do plan on um, starting like just a Mesh Fusion channel on YouTube, um, just where, I can uh, just do maybe like one little project a week. Um, that's my goal. Um, and I already have one like- little project a week. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, 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 have a, I have a list on my phone of just like, I keep thinking, oh, I can make this with Mesh Fusion. How would I do that? Okay. And then I make little notes and I'm like, and more often than not, like with using curves, like I can kind of visualize in my head how, how I would make, you know, like a, like a timepiece, like a, like a pocket watch. I had that idea and I was like, okay, I can make the gears this way. I can make the kind of ornate case this way, or the, the crown was all mesh fusion. Um, everything in that, in that demo that you shared was, uh, was mesh fusion. And it all originated with, um, maybe late at night, I was trying to put my daughter to sleep and I was just on my phone with one hand, just saying like, okay, I can make this or I can make this with mesh fusion. <laughs> That is Dedicated. awesome. Okay, so I, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, the, it, it seems like all you guys have keyed into what the next question is going to be on every little mini interview. Because your final mm -hmm. question is, you're a fairly new dad, and you still keep pushing out amazing content. I'm almost afraid to ask, but what else do you do other than be a dad and, and use Moto and Mesh Fusion? Yeah, that's definitely taking up all my time. I mean, between work and just using Moto in my spare time. Um, I, I keep sketchbooks I draw routinely, um, but now it's just like, um, I buy the cheapest sketchbooks on Amazon and I just draw with a ballpoint pen. Like I don't have time for anything else really, but it just, um, it gets that traditional kind of um, need out of me, which is just to remain, you know, a traditional artist. I don't post much. I don't post anything really, uh, my traditional art, but that's another thing that I'd like to, I'd like to change. And I'm de definitely inspired by by Thomas. Like the, the, the work she's doing is, um, Again, it's awesome. And it's really made me like, I, I look at that and I'm like, she's she's releasing stuff, how often? Like two two or three times a week or a little more even sometimes? Yeah, something like yeah. that. I, I gave myself a goal to do like a certain number in a year. Um, so I'm just trying to keep at it every day, but you should post your stuff. I'd love to see it. Yeah, I definitely plan on it, so. I love seeing all three of you guys go back and forth on, on the stuff that you have to present. So I'm looking forward to seeing more of this. Well, um, this has been quite an awesome series of interviews and demos, and I, I can't thank you guys enough. Um, and kind of to wrap this all up, um, you know, this is the beginning of changes for Mesh Fusion. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of effort to completely revamp the workflow, and it led to a lot of uh, stability and even performance improvements. But there is a goal behind this, and this was the foundation of basically new workflows in Modo. Um, these are things that I can't fully elaborate on, and I've struggled recently to try and express what it really means. Um, but what we want to do is we want to try and make modeling easier for, you know, the average user and at the same time enable, you know, um, more advanced users to be able to leverage these tools in more advanced and performant ways. So what you look at when you see Mesh Fusion with this ability to like just click in the viewport and get the asset you want to work on immediately, um, you know, strip previews that we can have deferred updates on at all times, but you still understand what you're modifying, um, you know, and, and just a a lot of the uh, like the material modes, for instance, that you can look at a model in the viewport and be able to say, okay, that's a primary, that was an additive element, that was subtracted, that was intersect, and just being able to read a scene very quickly are indicative of how we want to introduce new methods of modeling uh, to users going forward. So you're going to see a lot more enhancements to Mesh Fusion on its own, but you're also gonna see some of these things that we've done start to be applied to other tool sets slowly. And so there's uh, there's some very fun workflows that we've been kind of hashing out in the background. And uh, I think it's gonna become clear as we move forward how this all began with Mesh Fusion. So I'm very excited. This is in everybody's hands now. And um, just like I'm getting feedback from these three talented users here, I'd love to hear that feedback from other new users who are playing with the, the new workflow, because uh, that's only gonna make better tools uh, throughout 
throughout the entire application as we go forward. So thank you guys so much um, for the past year of effort. You're all very busy people who have uh, who shared a lot of your time with us and, and your effort. And I can't thank you enough. And uh, yeah, I, I hope you guys get some rest uh, within the next um, week. I know it's been a love, rough month. You know. Definitely. <laughs> It is here too. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys. And uh, we will talk soon. Later. All right. All right.